but you can't expect to wield supreme executive power just because some watery tart threw a sword at you. Shut up! Hello and welcome to an episode of The Broken Meeple, a show devoted to board games and card games. If you wanted the Disney Channel, it's on the other side. You clicked on the wrong video, but never mind. You're here now, so hope you're listening. This is a sort of review, a kind of review slash first impressions, call it what you will, of Tainted Grail, Kings of Ruin. This giant box is what the effectively the whole set came in as I got it from Kickstarter. And, you know, this one is a sequel to a game that I've talked about a lot on my top 100s or most formatic games or best campaign games. Anytime I've talked about that sort of subject area, Tainted Grail has popped up because I don't have the time to do a lot of campaigns. You know, there's all these games like Oh Sworn and ISS Vanguard, you know, also from this publisher and, you know, and a bunch of other campaign games. I'm just like, oh, for crying out loud, I can't do them all. There's not enough time. There's so many games I want to play in solo modes and I don't like to commit my Myself too long to one game forever and ever and ever without seeing a resolution to it. But there are exceptions to the rule. I know I do like the Pandemic Legacy games, but even then, once I get to about the 10th game onwards, I'm like, can we start wrapping this up a bit, you know? And so I, my, my attention span for campaigns is tricky. It's why I don't do RPGs anymore. Well, Kings of Ruin, sorry, Tainted Grail, is the exception where I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna have one campaign game at least that I stick to and like stick to with my guns and do the entire thing. And it's always been this one, mainly because the theme is so good. Oh, the theme in the original Tainted Grail. I mean, I have played Tainted Grail. I've played the first, uh, I think it's called The First Night, Age of Legends, not Red Death. I don't want it to be too hard. We'll get onto that in more detail later. But, you know, I've certainly just love this dark, twisted, Arthurian grisly theme that Tainted Grail has. The story and writing was amazing in the first one and so I was excited to get a copy of this. I mean I think it was my number one anticipated game of this year so hopefully it's delivering but essentially what has happened is that I am at the moment ended the fifth chapter out of ten. There are ten chapters as far as I'm aware in the box and I am on the end of the fifth chapter now so I feel like I've got halfway through the game. This is as good a time as any to talk about it in more detail to say some pros, say some cons and give it a verdict as I'm going along. Maybe I'll do a follow-up video at the end of this campaign or talk about it on the podcast, but to be honest, it's not like I'm going to get to the end of the whole campaign and suddenly be like, oh yeah, all my opinions have changed from now. It's like, if I'm not enjoying it now, then why would I be enjoying it later? You know, it's kind of like that. So, without further ado, I'll try and condense this as much as I can, but uh, yeah, it's a big one. Get on with it. The premise is essentially the same if you've played the original one. You get to control one of four characters, each one with their own unique starting sort of abilities and you know different stats for stamina and health and insanity. And you're only gonna see three here because the other one is the character I'm playing. But essentially what happens is that you take control of one of these and then through a story narrative, this is a, a I believe you get a more hardback journal uh, compared to normal. This is the spiral bound version that I got as a upgraded extra in the Kickstarter, but basically what you do is that you travel on these different location cards. Uh, I'm not going to give away too much here. We got the, the strutting forest, whatever it is. Your characters will use this as a map. You'll move around the landscape and you'll go through a story which is predominantly based from this journal. So you'll go to a location, this one's number 104, and you decide, I want to explore this location. You'll look in the book for number 104, the section on that, I'm not gonna find it exactly, but for example, let's say it's this one. And so you'll start off reading the initial blurb as to what's there, and you'll be directed to different verses depending on choices that you make, actions that you wanna do, or what's to stats you have for your attributes and so on and so forth. That's a typical exploration. But what is essentially going on is that you are going through this main plot. You know, you decide, I want to get across King's Pass and do something for whatever reason. Each character has got their own backstory. My case, you know, I have a, a potentially a deed to something pretty uh, nice and fruitful in a distant land and I want to get over there. Well, 
it's a bit tricky because most of the landscape is covered in something called wordness. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, W-Y-R-D-ness. But the idea is, is wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Weird wibbly wobbly gribbly stuff. It's a mist. It's a mist, it's a fog, it covers the landscape and basically if you're in the midst of it, then all sorts of weird twisty nasty start appearing and coming out and you know, just think monsters from the depths of your nightmares. There is some pretty freaky stuff in some of these encounters, it must be said. But the idea is, is that you know, some of this landscape will be safe, some of it won't, and what you'll do is that you'll light these waystone markers as you go through that take this weirdness and sort of almost kind of um, put it aside, like it, it acts as a barrier. So as long as they're lit, you can go to a location and interact with it, but as soon as the waystone marker is gone, whoo, the mist comes back and you can still explore some of those locations, but they'll be, you know, they're few and far between. For the most part, it's just generally quite gribbly, quite nasty. You don't want to go in there. Look, let me go back in there and face the peril. No, it's too perilous. As with any story-based game, you will have items that you can craft, some items that you'll collect from merchants that you trade with or ones that you just find on dead bodies or overturned wagons as you go along. You'll have to maintain some resources. These are some upgraded components. For the most part, they're typically just uh, cubes that you'll use normally but you know you've got to maintain your food to recover your health and sanity you've got wealth you might need to barter with some traders or buy your way out of a sticky situation magic um, it's a statistic you can use in combat and diplomatic encounters and then you've got experience points and, and a couple of other little attributes that I don't want to spoil for the most part now, as always with games like this, there'll be monsters for you to fight and people for you to enact your diplomatic skills with. And this game tries to direct you into kind of deciding which way you want to go. I mean, you're going to need some element of both, but you may decide to focus on one element over the other. And to be honest, it's kind of recommended that you do. I don't really want to say much more because I don't want to spoil more of the plot, but essentially a campaign game with a really dark, grisly theme and, you know, you've just got to survive as best as you can. So we'll quickly talk about the aesthetics and the components. They're still pretty good from before. I mean, if you've got the retail version, like the normal version of the game, you are going to have to mess around with a bunch of these like little red cubes for tracking your resources and stuff. It's quick, it's easy, but it is nice to have some like, you know, slightly different like plasticky resources from the upgrade kit, or you can just use your own from Stonemaier chests or the like. But the components in terms of miniatures, yeah, it's Awakened Realms. Of course the miniatures are insane. Now, you know, I have a couple of extra boxes for miniatures, you know, for some of the monster characters that you can find, but you can still get really nice looking miniatures, either sun drop or not, for your player characters. The waystone markers look really cool, like this big sort of skeletal throne thing that stands up in your map, you know, it's really cool and imposing. But then, then they get a little bit silly. And I do mean really silly. Like, um, like... Not this kind of silly. I mean, this is a big sort of, you know, fairly imposing character. You know, that's already pretty big when you put it on the table. No, 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 no. I mean, that's that's not silly enough. We can go one step better, can't we? Yeah, we can get this wretched thing. Oh boy, I'm not gonna tell you who this guy is, but uh, Subtle. Mm -hmm. this is a rather large model that can be on the table and take up too much space. There's there's a few of these models that you will get in the normal game as opposed to having to get like a Kickstarter copy of this. But yeah, the miniatures, they look fantastic and the artwork, love it as well. The art that you see in the exploration journal or on the location cards and particularly some of these encounter cards where you look at the artwork for the nasties that you can fight, it's top notch stuff. It really does, you know, from a visual standpoint, set the scene really nicely. But of course, aesthetics aren't everything. In order to have an immersive campaign game, the writing and the story must be really good. Tainted Grail did it in spades. Some of the best writing I had seen in a campaign game to date. No different here. I can't really say which one's better because they're both just really damn good. You know, this thing, you know, forget which type of look of journal you've got. This thing is packed with verses and branching paths and different locations and all sorts of story beats. And it's not just simply you walk into a town, see a barter, sorry, see, a, why do I keep saying the word barter? Seeing a trader and you decide you want to, you know, you know decide you want to buy something going. That's it. No, no, no. This thing goes into really nice detail. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just going to mention one location here. I'm not going to say where it is. Uh, the cold waters that flow from the mountains have carved out arches and tunnels and the cracked slopes leading to the lower lands of 
X. It's easy to lose your sense of direction here. Solar symbols painted on rocks offer little assistance to lost travelers, since the rocks seem to rearrange every time a cloud of weirdness passes by, as if nature itself wasn't sure what their original place was. You know, that's a fairly standard opening for a location, but that's just a location opening. You know, the, the character, the dialogue, and all the stuff that happens, the story beats themselves, are just so good. I love the way the story branches out in this one, because, you know, I've been through five chapters, and particularly in a couple of the middle chapters, I think say chapter three in particular, chapter four even, you know, you get some serious branching path capabilities here because you'll have to associate with, uh, you know, these particular people and who you associate with and who you do favors for and who you don't is going to have major changes for the later part of the game, or at least from like the middle section I'm in now. And I could have approached it from probably about five or six different ways. I mean, there were so many different like choices I have. I was like, do I help you? Do I help you? Could help you, or maybe you both. Hmm, which ones? Well, you know, I fancy doing something for this guy over here. Well, they're not gonna be pleased about it. And it's like, well, I gotta choose which way do I wanna go. And I love that this thing does give you those options. Complexity remains about the same as before. You know, you've got a fairly large rule book to get through. And for the most part, it's written well. You know, there's a couple of times when you think, it's a little bit hard to fathom and certainly I think maybe the layout could have been better in certain instances but there's a decent amount of pictorial examples and for combat and diplomacy they have an entire like example of like the first three turns for each one which is pretty cool you've got a rule summary on the back always appreciated and you do have a lot of these reference cards that you can put in front of you but one thing I do highly recommend is that you use the Start Here book. Yes, they give you a starting kind of multi-part tutorial to go through, and it will basically guide you through how to use the journal, how to travel, how to start the day, how to do events, how to do a combat, how to do a diplomacy. You will get the majority of the game kind of set in stone in your brain just from doing this tutorial, and it's pretty solid. I liked it in the first game. I liked it in this one as well, although for me it was kind of half teaching your grandmother to suck eggs because for the most part if you've done the first game you already kind of know how this is going to work but if you come into this blind like you've never played the original Tainted Ground you're jumping straight into Kings of Ruin definitely use this you're going to need it. This is the way. Now one problem with Tainted Grail was that the game focused a bit too much on combat. Yes you could do some diplomatic stuff but it did feel to me that if you were bad at combat you were just generally going to suck. It was just not going to go well. <laughs> This one does try to split you down between combat and diplomacy, requiring you to have an element of both. Yes, you'll probably still specialize, but it's giving you the option to approach the game depending on how you are geared for. So there are, for example, some boss characters you can come across. Now you could fight them or you could be doing diplomacy with them. You get to decide which way you're doing it. And that's something that I appreciate a lot in this game because I'm not always the sort of person that likes to be the combat munchkin and just go around and hack and slash stuff. In fact, I am playing Osbert here, you know, this little effectively a dwarf character it might as well be, and he kind of sucks in combat really, you know, but he's pretty good at diplomacy, well, good enough anyway, and I'm focusing him a lot on diplomacy. You know, I'm not completely ignoring combat, but for the most part, I'm just trying to escape from every combat I come across and use my diplomacy to get through the various plot arcs of the story. And there's been several occasions like that. I mean, I could go to this, let's say for example, I'm going to go to this camp over here and it's like, hmm, residents have got some problems with these people, you know, we need to deal with them. Well, you could go in and hack and slash them all to death. Hey! <laughs> or you could decide to barter with the leader and say, you know what, maybe we can come to a compromise here. I would take the latter option, but the book is so far giving me the chance to do that. So I don't feel that I'm in a situation where I can't progress past a chapter because I'm spilt for diplomacy and it demands that I fight somebody so much better that it's giving me the choice to do that. So you can play the type of character you want to play and the story so far is not kicking me in the rear end for it. 
Your kids are soft. The combat and diplomacy still remains the same pretty much from the original Tainted Grail, and this was a make or break for some people. Some people didn't like the way combat and diplomacy worked in this game. I personally kind of like it. It's a, it's a cool card-based system where you'll come across the enemy and it will essentially start you off with some stats and some particular like levels or you know damage it will do. But what you have are these cards which have like little keys, well, they call them keys, but they're basically connectors on them. They have connectors on the side depending on the various attributes. And what you essentially have is a small hand of cards at the start of every combat, and you're deciding, right, well, hang on, I could flee in panic. What a combat card to have called flee in panic. But if I put that down there, I get a cube, I get a damage for connecting the practicality cube, but then I don't get much else and I don't like the effect. So maybe I'll put down distraction. Okay, well, that's pretty good. That gets me a couple of cubes. And now I can put this down as a bonus card, connecting up these little key connectors. And this gives me more bonuses. And that's kind of the gist. Diplomacy works similarly, except you're having to essentially bounce up this cube up and down this little track in order to get to a green section of the diplomacy track and it's similar to the combat except you're you're moving that marker rather than taking outright damage but you know it's a cool little puzzle just being able to try and figure out the best way to play your cards i mean do i do nothing for a turn take a hit and so i have more choices next do i just play one card do i try to empty out my whole hand in one great big salvo it's kind of up to you now there is a bit of an rng element you know a random element to this because you are effectively drawing off a mini deck of 10 to 15 cards effectively on average and so you might have some really good cards that just don't come up or you might be thinking well i could really use this type of card now and you draw and it doesn't come up. It does happen. You might have to repeat a combat, you know, once or twice, particularly if it's like an ending boss character or so. But that's kind of the nature of the beast. You know, you have to accept that. But there's no die rolling for the most part in terms of that aspect. I mean, the most most of the die rolls you do are some story-based aspects where you might have to roll and then add modifiers based on your attributes, and you roll for these guardian menaces that go around the map and sort of hinder your progress. But for the most part, combat and diplomacy stay away from using dice mechanics. The occasional card might say, roll the die and apply a result. They're typically named as such, like, you know, stroke of chance or gambling or whatever, but they are very few and far between. For the most part, the combat is deterministic by the cards you play and what the enemy does, which is kind of welcomed. The grindiness has been reduced quite dramatically. It's still there to an extent. There is an element of trying to top up on resources, particularly if you don't play the normal story mode, uh, sorry, the, the easier story mode, the one that I play, but the you know, most of the grindiness has been removed. You no longer have these things on a time limit to light your way. They're now permanent. So you can only have three up at a time, but once they're up, they're up. You know, a particular guardian monster might roam around and occasionally take them down, but for the most part, they'll stick around and you get to decide how you go through the landscape. Always a good thing. But I've also found that through these first five chapters, I haven't needed to like, you know, spend ages like, oh, I just gotta get a bit of food here or a bit of a, you know, a bit of, wealth there. I just need to grind this bit before I can finally progress. Those moments haven't really appeared, which is so good. Barely an inconvenience. They haven't fixed everything though. The difficulty is still a bit of a problem. You can play this in normal mode, the story mode, which is the like the way I play it, the easier mode where they lighten up on a few things, and you can even add more modifiers to effectively have what's called challenge mode. I can't imagine what kind of masochist you have to be in order to play this game on challenge mode. It's already insanely hard on story mode. It doesn't need to be any harder. Now you can play this on normal mode if you want a pretty decent challenge and fine, you are going to get that challenge, believe me. But you'll also get a little bit of that added grindiness back. Playing this on challenge mode is just going to frustrate and annoy people all the time. But even though I play this on story mode and story mode has some like ease your modifier. So for example, you no longer have a limiter that means that your stamina is capped by your health level. That was always a pain in the butt, you know. Just because I've lost a few health points, suddenly I can't do very much on the turn, that's really annoying. Well, you remove that limiter with story mode, fantastic. But then there's a couple of other things. So you get to choose from more options when you level up your character, great. More options is good. I don't want a random element telling me I get some useless ability. Uh, but then there's uh, stuff to do with like the passage of time and you know how encounters and events are set up. You know to treat it so you don't face off against rock hard enemies quite from the get go. 
But one thing I do love on here is that it cheapens what it takes to light up these waystones. You know, the waystone cost is not as bad as it used to be, but it's still fairly expensive in this game on normal mode. In story mode, you pay a magic and that's it. Very nice and simple. One magic and the stamina and the uh, like stamina cost for the action. And that's pretty much it. And so it means that I can concentrate more on having fun with the story and the you know the encounters rather than having to deal with any grindiness. But even said then. There are some aspects in this game where I have come across where I think the difficulty is still a bit insane. Like, you know, ch the ends of certain chapters. I think the end of chapter three was already pretty tough. But then I got to the end of chapter four, particularly. And even the end of chapter two is not exactly the easiest thing in the world. And wow, I mean, especially the end of chapter four. That was a rock hard thing that I had to do in order to get past that. And it's made easier if you are found up to four of these of like these pieces of information beforehand. Where are these pieces of information? Sod if I know, they are literally just somewhere random in the, in the areas. I came across one of them before I came to that encounter and oh, I know where one of them is. It's impossible for me to do because it requires you to have stats that are way too high for me to ever get unless I focused on it from the get-go and I have no idea where the other two are. I could wander around aimlessly trying to find them but that would take forever and it would just be a waste of time and not very enjoyable. Found anything yet? Nothing yet, sir! But because I didn't have those aspects before I got to the encounter, the encounter I only got through by sheer blind luck on one attempt where I drew such an uber combo of cards for the diplomatic encounter that I was able to just about squeak a victory. But man, you could be rinse repeating that final boss encounter for like, ages and ages and ages before you get through it and you know some of these monsters and some of these things that you do fight do feel a little bit on the tough side you know I can't imagine wanting to play this with those extra limiters with the health and the, the expensive waystones and you know having harder monsters from, from the offset I just wouldn't want that so if you're gonna get this know that you're getting quite a tough game anyway but I do recommend you play in story mode just Play on story mode and have more fun with the game. The game is not a cakewalk. There is nothing about this game that is easy, okay? You're still going to be fighting for resources. You're still going to be trying to keep yourself alive. And you're still going to have tough stuff to fight. And you still need to effectively race against the clock in order to get stuff done. So you're not hampered on other aspects. You'll still get that in story mode. Just have fun. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. And part of that problem with the difficulty curve is slightly exasperated by the idea of playing this true solo. The game does feel like it is designed for a two player experience. You can play this with three or four fine, but when you play it with two, you can have two characters, one for combat, one for diplomacy, and kind of shore up each other's weaknesses. When you play true solo though, you kind of have to do everything with just one character, but you can't. You can't be a little bit in combat and a little bit in diplomacy because you will just fail at all the harder stuff. You've got to pick one of the routes and go with it, but then you have to accept that you have to suck at the other aspect and you don't have a way to get yourself out of Stuck. Now I am playing true solo and it is the way I want to because trying to micromanage two decks at a time, particularly in combat by yourself, is a bit of a chore, but yeah, I, I do wish maybe they put in a few extra ways to make true solo like a bit more approachable or a bit less punishing. You know, this is something I kind of have to deal with and I accept it, but still, on the second iteration, you kind of should have thought about that by now. But for most people, they play this as a two-player game, and two players, I think, works pretty well. Three and four, if you want to have a little RPG group together, but really all you're adding is more time. There are a couple of aspects where I'm not as keen on them, but they are mostly variants and you don't necessarily need to use them. There's one particular variant where you have this backstory for your character, and so when you meet certain criteria during the game, you get to tick off little boxes, and as you do so, you'll read a little bit of a sort of blurb at the back of this book about your character's history, and you'll eventually be able to unlock a couple of cards, which are one-use cool powers. Hours. They're not that interesting, they're just there, and if you manage to get all of them, you'll unlock one last uber ability, which from the first game was decent enough, but it requires a fair bit of effort. And some of these things that you have to do are easy, like you'll do them within a couple of turns. You're like, oh yeah, I've already done that, let's read that memory. And then there are some that are so specific that it'll be 
God knows when, if you'll ever get a chance to do them. So, you know, I'm at the end of chapter five. I haven't completed all mine yet. There's still two I need to do, and I'm not entirely certain how I'm going to do them. You know, they are quite tricky. But it's a pretty minor aspect of the game, and you don't even need to use it. You can just ignore it entirely. It's just whether you want a few extra paragraphs of writing to read and something else to aim for in the scenarios. But it's a bit like what was in that role player adventures when they did something similar. I don't think it works that well and it's it's there. It's nice. It's a variant. So I can't really, you know, harp on it too much, but yeah, would have liked it to have been a little bit more fleshed out. So is this another solid tainted grail game? Yeah, pretty much. I still really enjoy this and I'm enjoying going through this campaign. Is it revolutionizing Tainted Grail? Not particularly. I mean, they have released an upgrade kit for the first lot, although as much as I've got that arriving, I don't know if I'm that inclined to go back to the originals and play them over again just with the slight new upgrades. I'm not sure if I'm that keen. But for those of you just jumping into Tainted Grail, I think that's a really cool thing that they're doing that. And so like removing some of the original grindiness and bringing that up to what they call 2.0 rules. That's really cool. But here, this is essentially an expansion for me with some tweet rules in it. You know, it's giving me more of the same, more of what I liked before. It gives me more story, more content, more characters to pick from, more stuff to do. And I'd be happy enough with that. But I do appreciate that for the two big aspects that I am allowed to decide how I want to approach scenarios from a combat perspective or from a diplomatic perspective, but also that it has removed some of those grindy aspects that the original Tainted Grail had. Now it is a long campaign, it's going to take you a while. It is still punishingly difficult, you know, at times. You know, the story mode makes it decent enough. I mean, I haven't really had to house rule a lot so far in this game, and I know that sounds bad that I'm house ruling at all. When I say house ruling, I mainly mean that for certain really difficult parts, I might have had to have gone oh, come on, you got to give me a little bit of leeway here because this is ridiculous, you know, especially if it was just going to make me go rinse repeat a lot. You're certainly going to get a lot of content for your money. I mean, it's not a cheap game for sure, but there's plenty of story here to keep you immersed. There's plenty of branching paths to allow for possibly a second playthrough if you want to play other characters or try different options. But even just playing this once through, I'm only at the end of chapter five and it's taken me a lot of hours to get to that point. I've still got half the game to go and it's possible that the later chapters will be longer than the earlier chapters, you know, because I think that's kind of how it worked in the original Tainted Grail. So I know I've got plenty of stuff to explore. I mean, I've got a whole deck of cards here that I haven't come across yet of locations, right? This I haven't explored yet and I'm halfway through the chapters. I think I've got plenty enough to keep me busy for a long time. So they have improved on the original formula, not made it entirely easy to approach from a, you know, from a difficulty standpoint, but fixing some of those grindy issues is still really cool. I'm giving it a nine out of 10. It's still really enjoyable, still such a great campaign story and my choice for a campaign game. Other good ones have come out from time to time. I like Vanguard, not so much the dice aspect, but I like the story and the whole like customizing your ship. Oath Swarm was pretty good for the most part. There was a couple of things that hurt me with it and it was a massive rules and table hog, but you know, I liked it fine, but I still hold to this day that Tainted Grail is the campaign that I've had the most fun with, the most time invested, and the one that if I'm going to pick from all the campaigns that are out there, this is the one I would pick. It does the job for me. It's by no means perfect. It's not for everybody, whether it's the setting or the difficulty curve or the amount of stuff you have to do, but it's still a really solid game and I'm enjoying it so far. I'll comment a little bit maybe on the podcast about what it's like when I get to the end of the campaign, but for now, after five chapters, effectively half the story, I'm really enjoying it and I'm keen to progress further. So that's it for me on this episode of The Broken Meeple. If you like what you see, then please thumb it up on YouTube and thumb it up on the page when it goes live on Board Game Geek. Don't forget to check out my other videos. You can find my original Tainted Grail review if you look hard enough, but there's not been a huge amount of other stuff lately because most games haven't been released, hence I thought I would talk about this one for a change. But, you know, by all means, check out some of the uh, top 10s I've done recently and there's more on the way. Uh, let me know your comments down below. What did you think of the original Tainted Grail? Have you got your copy of this yet? Are you finding some of the uh, problems that I am? Or perhaps you found some stuff that I haven't mentioned? By all means, get it in the comments. Let us know your experiences. Although, if you can, make them spoiler-free, please. I've tried my best to make this spoiler-free, so I would appreciate 
appreciate it if you did it as well. Until next time, remember, regardless of whether you have any desire to meet this guy or not, trust me, it's, um, it's eventful. It's still only a game. Bye for now.